very warm welcome to uh, everyone to this first seminar in the Development Studies uh, seminar series for the year. My name is Faisi Ismail and I coordinate the series together with a number of colleagues um, and uh, student volunteers and I have to say the seminar series wouldn't work without uh, our student volunteers and I want to just take this opportunity to thank everyone involved. I know you've just got involved but, um, and we've got sort of 16 seminars ahead but I really want to thank you for, um, for getting involved. Um, and also to our, to our colleagues, um, many of them have been uh, organising the series for a number of years and what we've aimed to do from the beginning is to create a forum for discussion uh, and debate uh, amongst um, you know, the vast number of topics that are directly and indirectly related to uh, development studies, um, to development in the Global South, but also its relationship with uh, the Global North. So it's about supplementing what we learn and what we teach in development studies, but also touching on debates that go beyond uh, the classroom uh, as well. Um, and for this seminar, we're very pleased to hear from David Bailey on austerity, populism, protest, people power in the age of uh, dissent. And I don't have to tell you um, how relevant this is at the moment, both because of the global mobilizations uh, around the climate crisis in the past several months um, by, by the youth strikers, but also the current protests uh, that have just kicked off um, yesterday by Extinction Rebellion but also the vast number of protests that are going on uh, all around the world, the strikes, the occupations um, that are happening. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, Jay will uh, be chairing, uh, we'll, she'll explain the format, um, and, uh, and then we'll have room for, uh, for questions. Thank you. Welcome everybody. I'm, I'm going to speak quite loudly because we're still in the process of getting the microphone set up, but I hope everyone can hear me. It's one of the benefits of having a booming, loud voice. Um, I'm Jay. I will be, um, I'm on the organising committee of the seminar series and I will be chairing tonight. Um, our talk this evening um, will document and illustrate the key trends in different acts of protest witnessed in neoliberal Britain since 2010, assessing the reasons why people have turned to protests the effects it's having on British democracy, and putting these questions into a broader historical and global perspective in order to understand the current stagnant phase of neoliberalism and its related age of dissent. And as Faisi just said, the focus is on the UK, but this uh, talk has never really been so relevant to the global context, whether we're talking about the news in Ecuador just today, whether we're talking about the ongoing protests in Hong Kong, what's going on, on in Algeria. So it's uh, never been as apt a time to have this um, particular seminar. Our speaker tonight is Dr. David Bailey. David is Senior Lecturer in Politics at the University of Birmingham. His research and teaching focus on the way that protest interacts with capitalism. He recently co-authored a book on different forms of anti-austerity and opposition within the neoliberal European Union, titled Beyond Defeat and Austerity, Disrupting the Critical Political Economy of Neoliberal Europe. He's also reviews editor and editorial board member of the journal Capital and Class, and currently the chair of Critical Political Economy Research Network. And our discussant will be Dr. Faisi Ismail, who is a senior teaching fellow here in the Department of Development Studies and, of course, the chief organiser of this amazing seminar series. Um, Faisi has taught at, as well as at SOAS, has taught at UCL in Geography and at Goldsmiths in Media, Communications and Cultural Studies. Her research interests include NGOs and social movements, alternatives to neoliberalism and imperialism, labour and migration, and politics and development in Nepal and South Asia. She's on the executive committee of the Britain-Nepal Academic Council and the editorial board of Capital and Class. So the format of the seminar will be as follows. David is going to speak now for 45 minutes. Faisi will then comment for five to seven minutes and David, if he wants to, can then respond. Um, we'll then open up to all of you for questions. And as we've said, although the, the context or the speech is going to be about British democracy, we'd very much welcome um, comments and thoughts about its connections to the wider global context. If you're tweeting, please use the hashtags SOASDevStudies, 
and ESRC. So without further, further ado, I'll hand over to David. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to speak. Thanks for agreeing to come and listen to me. And uh, Faisy asked me to speak about um, well, what's going on. What's going on with the crisis of democracy? What's going on with capitalism? What's going on with the rise of populism? It's all kind of big general stuff that we're all thinking about. So, and we all have opinions on. So, I guess I haven't got the answer, but I've got, I guess, a take on it that um, we can then use to, to engage with. And I suppose the way that I'm trying to come into this is to think about... Uh, what tended, to, I suppose, for the, t the decade of, 2000, of the 2010s in Britain to be thought of in terms of the age of austerity and to try to think about that uh, as maybe not so much the age of austerity but the age of dissent and to switch it around to think about what, for, what ways are people seeking to survive, to maintain a voice and to seek to put pressure on government at a time when the opportunity and the constraints within which to, uh, to influence public policy are narrowing. And so I suppose this is also a kind of uh, a general trend that you want to think about. How does capitalism relate to democracy and how does capitalism, especially in periods of crisis, in periods of stagnation, which we, I think we can all agree is happening now, how does that then uh, affect the relationship of capitalism and democracy? So I guess I would start by saying, if we're going to try to think about a, some kind of crisis of capitalist democracy, then probably we say it's not a new crisis, probably we can agree on that, and that there's always been a tension between, the, between democracy and between capitalism. And that tension, maybe a lot of people are talking at the moment about how that tension and crisis is becoming increasingly prevalent. I suppose maybe probably Wolfgang Strake is one of the key people that have been talking about this demise of democratic capitalism and, and, an, and almost a kind of no route back. But I think we can say that that, democracy capitalism relationship has always been in tension from, from, the, from the beginning. So if we think um, in terms of how democracy itself was created, uh, one of the best studies I think in terms of a kind of historical comparative study is by Jaworski who talks about, who tries to document the first introductions of democracy in the, towards the, uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century and showing how that directly comes out of episodes of unrest and protest. And I guess in that sense, dismissing the notion that democracy is a kind of liberal ideal that, uh, that elites uh, found to be the correct way to organise society, but rather seeing democracy as, all, from the start, a concession to acts of protest to, in an attempt to offer sufficient concessions to enable the elites to, con to, to maintain their position of power, but, but not to upset that hierarchy too greatly. So he shows, this is, a, this is quite helpful, so this shows what, what are the kind of key factors that led to the emergence of the first emergence of the extension of uh, the vote to people without property and then to women, and talks about how, but first of all we can see a correlation between after war, so that after the war uh, elites tended to be more concerned about unrest, and then after, after this factor we look at unrest and we find that the extension of the vote both to uh, people without, to men without property and then to women was as directly associated with instances of unrest occurring before it. So it was already protest pushing democracy to come into existence. And this kind of tries to map that historically and then show, try to identify the relationship between uh, the granting of or extension of the vote to certain groups and, and peaks of unrest. And what we see is almost immediately beforehand the unrest reaches a, peak, reaches a peak in this kind of historical process before then uh, it, the vote is extended. And once the vote is extended, unrest tends to drop off as well. So it's, he's kind of trying to show explicitly that there's this kind of concession element to democracy. It's some degree of decision-making is granted, but only enough to, to seek to quell unrest. So you've already got that, that, that tense relationship between democracy and capitalism uh, from the start. And I think perhaps to try to help us kind of theorise what this relationship, some of the key people that I would probably point to to talk about this, this kind of constant uh, conflict of logics between the logic of democracy and the logic of capitalism. The logic of democracy talks about the need for popular demands, collective voice to be expressed, uh, 
self-determination of individuals, but also of classes, social groups, majority rule, uh, um, and then a, a free association, all of which, at the same time, as it's part of capitalist democracy, also has to somehow be made to fit with the logic of capitalism. So Ellen Maskin Woods is good on this, trying to show how it was only once the notion of what do we mean by the democracy as a kind of very narrow, formal type of representative democracy, once that had been established as what we mean by democracy, it was only then that it could be, met, could be rendered compatible with, uh, with capitalism. So there's already a need to constrain choice to make, sure, to make democratic demands compatible with the logic of capitalism. And in terms of the logic of capitalism, some recent people I think who are helpful in this, Anwar Sheikh and Nancy Fraser. Anwar Sheikh talks about how, drawing on Marxist, general Marxist framework, how the exchange of commodities is central. So once you have commodity exchange as the central principle of social interaction, that obviously clashes with some notion of democratic choice. That the competitive pursuit of profit is the kind of key driving force that underpinning the organisation of production especially. That, that produces a centralising centralization and concentration, so we have, which explains inequality. Problems with disequilibrium are then created because, for various reasons, partly consumption becomes difficult the more inequality that you have. And problems of, and then moving towards mechanisation, ration, rationalisation, robotization. I suppose, is what we're talking about now in terms of the introduction of technology and how that's then creating... Uh, uh, an economy without jobs and then all of that is associated with declining profit rates if you, if you adopt the kind of classical Marxist framework and declining profit rates then produce, growth, produce a declining growth and the declining growth I think is key to understanding how this, this, this tense relationship between democracy and capitalism becomes tenser and that over time that, that becomes more problematic to render the two compatible we see an expansion and intensification towards the world market, as a, partly as an attempt to resolve some of these problems. And also at the same time, moving more to kind of Nancy Fraser's framework in her recent book, um, Capitalism, the Conversation in Critical Theory, to, trying to theorise, well, how does the, outside of this very narrow sphere of what we think about capitalism, how does that relate to our understanding of what's going on? And she talks about, um, about boundary condition, background conditions and then boundary conflicts over those background conditions, so the sphere of social reproduction home, civil society, as necessary for what's going on in the formal sphere of production and then a, a relation, and how that relationship is then also contested and then also nature as a resource to be extracted as part of what we understand by uh, capitalism and, and, and these problems. And then also all of this is associated with crisis and it's a predictable crisis. So I thought this is this, it's not very nice to have lots of text on the screen but I think this is a really nice passage in terms of helping us to understand the predictability of um, of capitalist crisis. So this is talking about how in the, boom, credit, in the boom, so before the bubble bursts, credit appeared to have the magical power of suspending altogether the barriers to the accumulation of capital, providing finance for new ventures and sustaining unprofitable capitalists through periods of difficulty. The only limit to accumulation appeared to be the availability of credit. As the boom gathered momentum, the ready availability of credit and the negotiability of credit money reduced the demand for cash. So that banks were able to reduce their cash ratios and continue to feed the boom by expanding credit. Capital overcomes the barrier to accumulation debts, and as debts were, re were regularly repaid, a mood of optimism prevails and credit becomes cheap and freely available. And eventually the boom was destined to break. The event that precipitated the crash, so the subprime crisis, may have been remote from the underlying cause of the crisis and at first appeared insignificant, yet it triggers the crash. It gains momentum as the contraction of, cap of credit precipitates defaults that spread through the financial system. In the crisis, the overaccumulation of capital suddenly appears in the form of a mass of worthless debt and an enormous overproduction of commodities. And we can see this, perhaps I think this is a nice picture. This is the uh, empty houses that sit in Spain, or sat in Spain, immediately after the crisis, everyone invests in housing, and then suddenly you have these worthless commodities that, well, obviously they have worth in terms of use, but they don't have any worth in terms of uh, being, being able to be, to be sold. But I, what, the reason I think this is interesting is because this is adapted from Simon Clark, right in 1988, which seems to describe almost exactly the way in which the subprime crisis transformed and, and the way that it played out. But it was obviously written in 1988, and... I think that highlights just that, the predictable nature of the types of crises that we're talking about with this, this expansion, forming of bubbles, the bubble burst, and that has a knock-on effect, and we have this period of stagnation. So then, where are we now in terms of, I'm talking particularly about 
British capitalist democracy, where are we now? I think we can probably agree that we're in a period of, st I would argue, a period of stagnant neoliberalism, that we had the neoliberal growth period after 1980, we had the bubble that formed and then collapsed in 2008, and really we have seen a return to some, de to some degree of growth, but the, the, the peak of growth that we saw in 2000, sorry, these are three-year averages, smooth. The, th the peak of growth that we see around 2013 during that, during the stagnant period, is almost as the same kind of level as the, as the trough going back to the 1960s. So that we can see this, the constantly declining average levels of growth during this post-war period. And also, we have to bear in mind the massive amount of monetary stimulus that's gone into producing this growth, with virtually no increase in productivity and arguably much of it is fueled by the creation of money and arguably, therefore, the, just the, simply the creation of the next bubble that's due to burst. And we can see this in terms of similarly le high levels of debt to income in terms of, so comparing with 2008, similarly high levels of house price, not quite as high, but similarly high levels of house, house price uh, inflation, all of which is obviously uh, an, an effect of this um, ultra-low, ultra-loose monetary policy, which is partly stimulated a low, a low level of stagnant growth. So I think that's the context probably in which I'm trying to speak in terms of thinking about this idea of an age of austerity or an age of dissent. And trying to think about, um, first of all, in terms of what happened. So as, as we know, in 2010, as the coalition government came into office, it saw high levels of public debt as a significant problem for the, uh, for the British Treasury and sought to respond to that by imposing a massive range of cuts across the, um, across the British public sector. It had the target to cut the deficit to zero by 2015 to 16, which it still hasn't achieved. Largely that was to be achieved through spending cuts including a two-year pay freeze for public sector workers, a shift in terms of how uh, inflation was calculated from one RPI to CPI, which basically made it cheaper for the government to keep up with its calculation of inflation. Housing benefit reforms were capped, disability living allowance, an imposition of condition, much greater levels of conditionality upon the receipt of uh, social spending and, um, and welfare benefits. Much of that was also passed off to local government, so 60% cut in local government funding from central government, and now we're seeing things like universal credit, the food bank crisis, and a freeze in social security payments. So I thought this is quite a nice illustration, well not nice, it's not a nice illustration, of, um, of some of the effects of this. This is recently uh, acquired through freedom of information requests from the government, <laughs> to identify deaths of people receiving incapacity benefit or severe disability allowance. So those people who died whilst they were receiving the benefit. And the, key, the most significant one, I think, is this work-related activity group, uh, which, is, which are basically the people who are encouraged or forced to work to receive their welfare benefits. The death rate for that group of people is nearly 11,000. And to compare that as an average of uh, the... the proportion of people who die during, in this age group is about four times higher. So you're putting people who are four times higher at risk of death, in, forcing them into uh, work as part of the kind of new conditionality regime that we see as part of this kind of austerity agenda. We also think see within, the, within the workplace reforms like the extension of the time when you can claim unfair dismissal from one year, so you now have to work for two years before you can claim unfair dismissal and the introduction of £1,200 employment tribunal fees which made it almost impossible for many people to even claim they've been unfairly sacked when they lost their job. So all of these reforms are part of a kind of attempt I suppose to move towards low wage, to promote the low wage sector and to reduce the role of the welfare state in supporting people. So that kind of is the context within which what I want to talk about is an age of um, as an age of austerity, but as an age of dissent, that, the, that the, those, those kinds of conditions have produced new and changing and higher levels of acts of protest 
which we can look and chart to see how they've developed uh, throughout this period. So I just... Um, This is a blog that I produced. There's a page on here called Political Protest in Britain, and there's a data set here, which is what the work largely draws upon. And this is uh, trying to show, or trying to map, rather, the different forms of protest activity that we've seen going back to the 1980s in Britain. And so what, what, we, what we do to generate this is to do a newspaper search uh, of four newspapers in the UK, from centre-left and, cent and right, and um, then once we do a search for protest, demonstrations or strikes, we can then try to identify the agent, the action that the agent did, and then the target of the action, in some cases there's no, tar there's no target, and use that to essentially create a catalogue of different types of protests that are witnessed in, uh, in the British context over this period of time. So it goes back to the 1980s, it's a sample for the 1980s, but it's um, from 2005 onwards, it's every um, act of protest identified during, uh, through the search. And what I think that helps us to do is to basically try to chart and understand how different agents of protest have emerged. And also, to, also I think what's interesting to see is how the layers of agents of protest change over time and how they have then a knock-on effect, how we have, we, might, we sometimes see protest as something that kind of has a, flashes up and then disappears. I think it's more helpful to think of it in terms of this kind of sedimentation of different, different forms of protest, produce different forms of subjectivity, which then sometimes translate into other forms of activity. But also I think what is significant about this is the way in which the agents of protest are growing and the frequency of acts of protest are growing, which is partly why I'm trying to say that this 2010 period, 2010's period is a, an age of dissent. So we can perhaps I'll just talk us through how, how, how long we're in for time at the moment. 20 in. Okay, good. Okay, so um, well, I'll try and talk us through some of the kind of key events. Some people are probably more familiar with some of this than others. Um, this, we, uh, so one of the first kind of uh, events that we saw after the 2008 crisis was a famous British Jobs for British Workers protest, which was a big national wildcat strike, so an unofficial strike, to the, to, which, was, which was done by engineer workers in the oil refinery industry. And it gained national attention because of this slogan, British Jobs for British Workers, but there's some debate about how kind of nationalist it was in, in the way that it was mobilised. But it was largely about the idea that post-2008 there'd been a casualisation of, um, of work, an attempt to undermine the working conditions of the engineers in the industry, and partly an attempt to bring Italian uh, workers in to undercut the agreed conditions in Britain. And so it created this big tension, which, with, which with hindsight can quite clearly be linked to some of the kind of demands around Brexit, which then developed over time subsequently. This is one of, kind of, one of the key kind of flashpoints that we see immediately after the crisis. Then once 2010 starts and this austerity agenda is unleashed by the coalition government, we have organisations like UK Uncut. So this is, um, the, their strategy was essentially to try to challenge the notion that there's no alternative to austerity by highlighting tax evasion and tax avoidance by certain key, uh, uh, um, quite often shops, and using the high street as a public space in which there they, they could be an attempt to gather and to raise awareness and to put shame onto those high street banks as a way of kind of publicising, first of all, those banks or shops, first of all, those high street outlets should be paying the right amount of tax, but also to challenge this notion that austerity was some kind of necessary agenda. This, then, we, then we see at this point when the tuition fees for domestic students was increased to 9,000 fees. We, had, we see in 2010 the big outpouring of student protest. So we can see these, the, the big bulge in student protest here around 2010. And then 2011 we see the riots 
which spread from London and then across the country. And then in terms of this kind of idea of a sedimentation and, and translation of the protests, we, we can see in this 2010 period uh, the big kind of three agents being anti-cuts, activists, students and workers. And then that kind of proliferates. So rather than, again, this idea that the, that goes away, I think there's more of an idea that this informs subsequent strategies of trying to influence public policy through alternative means, again, in, with this idea of a constrained democracy and a government unwilling to listen. So this is the um, Focus e E15 Mothers protests who use occupation strategies to highlight the, um, the decision of the government to move people from sites largely in London to sites outside of London in an attempt to redistribute housing, which was largely opposed. They're uh, increasingly using similar kind of direct action protest strategies to challenge the treatment of racialized minorities and migrants. So this is the closed down Yarl's Wood and all detention centres protest that we, uh, I put, to, put here as pro-minority protests. And again, in terms of forms of dissent, we just, just recently it was announced that there's been 3,000 hunger strikes in the last three years in detention centres in the UK, which really just kind of highlights that, um, that the treatment of people in detention centres in this kind of period of austerity, but also the, uh, the way in which individual protests can, can quite often not even get reported. So we're only picking up here the very visible stuff that manages to make it into the media. If we're talking about 3,000 hunger strikes happening, then we're really talking about very severe levels of, uh, of dissent and resistance. This is the end deportations protest, coming a bit closer to the present. I don't know if people followed this one, but the end deportations protest was um, an attempt to block the uh, use of deportations as a way of pushing people out of the country. And in the end, they uh, were convicted for anti-terrorism legislation. The first time that anti-terrorism legislation was used for this kind of direct action <coughs> anti-deportation protest. And fortunately, the sentences were light enough to mean that they didn't have very severe sentences, but the potential sentence that was associated was up to life imprisonment. And then I think we can also see, I think, and I suppose one of the points that I tried to make is that not, we're not only seeing... Uh, the, those hardest hit within society resort into these forms of dissent, but also there's a kind of mainstreaming of, of dissent, that some of the mainstream demands also, because they're not being listened to and they're not managing to channel into, into, into democratic outcomes, are also, now everyone basically is doing protests. So we can see the anti-Trump protests had a massive uh, increase in 2017, especially after the Trump's flight ban. Brexit is producing increasingly um, pro-EU protesters as, a, as a, perhaps not tip, the typical protester that we might have imagined five or ten years ago. And now, as, as part of this kind of mainstreaming of what it is to do protest, this is the green here is the pro-EU protesters. <coughs> and also, perhaps I try to, I mean, there's, also, there's sometimes a debate, well, what is it, is it really progressive protest? I mean, there's also, the far right also do protest, which is true. And this is the generally organised by Tommy Robinson, far right, nativist, white English kind of movement. But I tend to say it's not as bad as we think in terms of like, is protest enabling also unprogressive voices that we don't want to be articulated. I mean, when we look at the right wing as a proportion of the protest, it's this grey, it's always um, at, far outnumbered by the more progressive types of mobilisations that we see. It's also virtually always as a counter demonstration that happens and is of equal or unnormally larger size in opposition to the, the far right mobilisation. <laughs> There's been an increased mobilisation by feminists, especially Sisters Uncut, mobilising around the effects of austerity on women, especially the closure of refuge centres, um, occupations quite often used to draw attention to that, that, that kind of those kinds of problems. The Women's March as well pushed up the uh, feminist mobilisation as an as a explicit identity of protest. And then perhaps going right to, the right to the present, we're obviously now seeing school children, so for the first time we see school children emerge as a category of uh, protesters in, the, in 2000 and, 
19. And at the same time, we've already mentioned Extinction Rebellion, as well as, uh, again, seeing a massive bulge in terms of environmentalist mobilisation in the, in the present. And then also, perhaps just to kind of bring us back to British higher education, I thought it's quite notable that there's, again, this kind of idea of direct action, partly reflecting the, um, the demobilisation of, of trade unions, and perhaps now the remobilisation of it, that the, we see for the first time protests by union work by unionists against their their own trade union in this kind of no capitulation uh, conflict that happened around during the pensions dispute of uh, last year. So I think kind of illustrates nicely this kind of tension between uh, arguably weakened trade union movement and a <coughs> arguably growing and ascendant more kind of I guess dis, un, un, informal and disorganised forms of protest which we're seeing and charting in virtually all of these uh, illustrations that I'm showing here. And perhaps just also to kind of illustrate that as well, we can see the, if we look at, go back to the 1980s, these are average figures because it's a sample, going back to the 80s, we're seeing workers by far as the largest agent of, um, of protest during the 1980s and then much reduced for the rest of the period. So again, this kind of idea of neoliberalism is undermining the capacity of workers to, uh, to mobilise. You can also look at... Um, Types of protests. Oh, no. Okay, good. Uh, so, um, types of protest we can uh, also look at. I think two things that are interesting here in terms of the changing patterns. First of all, we again reflecting this idea of trade unions as being demobilised. We see um, strike activity as much more significant during the 1980s and much more diminished throughout the period. And then also perhaps what we can notice is the increased use of stunts. So I think part of this is also what I'm trying to say, that because there's this growing resort to protest as the way in which de democratic demands are attempted to be articulated, so you have to become more innovative in, in the way in which you do the protest and try to produce new stunts which might capture the uh, media's attention. So these are some... Ex so, some examples, I'll go around in clockwise. This is the face sitting protest of 2013, which was sex worker protests against the heightened regulation of sex work. This was the bike, <coughs> the bikes up, knives down protest by um, teenage bikers who are protesting against, partly against the lack of policing, or the, the lack of resources into policing, which is partly associated with the increased knife crime, especially in London. This is the um, Photo My Pants protest against the, uh, the MP who opposed the upskirting ban in Parliament. This is a coffin that was laid outside uh, a Conservative MP's um, house to highlight the impact of austerity in terms of its impact upon lives. This is a sit-in by uh, doctors during the junior doctors. Sorry, die in by doctors during the junior doctors' strike of 2016. And this is a more recent one. This is actually, I'm not sure if this counts as grassroots, but this is Jess Phillips, MP's son, who was um, placed outside uh, Downing Street to do his homework in opposition to the shortening of the teaching day. Now, schools increasingly are moving to cut the Friday afternoons from the timetable as a, as a cost saving measure. And, um, and so that's obviously raising concerns about how austerity is then having a knock-on effect in terms of both education, but also in terms of childcare and how childcare gets managed in this, uh, in this, in this kind of context. <coughs> so then I think probably then the question, like there's also the question of what, what's the point of doing the protest? People, people I suppose the, the one response to, or one dismissive response is to say that protest is kind of futile. Maybe you capture some media attention but you don't necessarily, uh, don't necessarily um, secure the outcomes that you want. And so what I've been trying to do is to look at, try to trace through <coughs> austerity initiatives and see to what extent opposition and protest and resistance does really matter. So um, this, is, there's a, this is a paper that's out and it's got a, a company and blog called Anti-Austerity in Low Resistance Models of Capitalism, which is a catchy title. And it's... Um, trying to trace through pro proposals for austerity in a number of initiatives and then to see what kind of opposition they encountered. One um, 
a couple of that are one that I'll talk about especially is the workfare initiatives, which we've talked about already, this idea of placing greater conditions upon uh, wel welfare support and social service, social security as a means by which to essentially force people into work as a condition for their uh, for their um, for the receipt of their benefits. And um, so what we find really is that we shouldn't be thinking about victories, like we, the, the aim of anti-austerity is to try to stop austerity. Really we should be thinking, I think, in terms of concessions, that the more mobilisation and, and the different types of mobilisation that we see, the more likely it is that concessions are extracted from, and the austerity proposals that go through are, um, are weakened. So in terms of the workfare, the main, the, we, saw four, we saw different a range of different types of protests. Some of them are kind of very individualist, this is, um, this is John MacArthur, age 59, who refused to attend his work placement in 2014 on the grounds that it was a job he would previously been paid to do. So he basically got sacked from his previous job and then got put in as a welfare claimant as a condition of getting his welfare benefits put into the same job that he'd just been sacked to do. So in protest, he paraded outside the company for two hours a day for three months with signs saying, say no to slavery. So we see these kind of individualist types of protests. We also see a kind of, um, a kind of, I guess what people call a sort of subterranean form of protest. Protests that don't make it into the news, but they are going on in terms of individual foot-dragging kinds of uh, resistance, unwillingness to, uh, to act in accordance with instructions that are being given, but not in an openly confrontational way. And so one study also conducted in Birmingham found how... Essentially, what, what um, claimants could do is that they could be, if it, that the, the agency, so an agency is hired to basically test whether you're willing to go into work or not, the agency would assess the, um, the, your degree of willingness. If you're very reluctant to go into work, then it's basically too much effort for the agency to, place you, to try to put effort into getting you into a placement. And that per placement, the agency gets a fee. So by being very reluctant, you almost kind of uh, escape the attention of the uh, agency that's trying to recruit you. And it's the mid-range re reluctant people that will tend to get targeted. So there's a process of gaming going on, which if we can think about perhaps as a sort of subterranean form of, uh, subterranean form of resistance. And then there's in a more kind of visible level, Boycott Workfare also used this idea that the organisation Boycott Workfare was tried specifically to oppose the workfare regime, used this idea of forced labour as a kind of key message in the media to oppose the workfare regime. And again, this idea of shaming in the high street. So they would turn up, Holland and Barrett was a uh, common target. They would turn up outside the employers' shops that were employing work, unpaid <coughs> workers or workers who had been forced to do that on, as a condition for their benefits to shame the firms into... Uh, abandoning the scheme, and it was relatively well, it was relatively effective because none of the firms wanted this stigma of basically being employing people for free and essentially being part participating in a form of kind of forced labour. To the extent that the government itself used the argument in court that they weren't prepared to tell the public who the firms were that were participating in this um, workfare scheme because, quote, if the public knew exactly where people were being sent on placements political protests would increase, which was likely to lead to the collapse of several employment schemes and undermine the government's economic interests. So in other words, the government itself recognises that the protests are effective and the protests are putting the firms off from participating in the scheme. And so they have to keep the thing secret, which was, for the protests themselves was great because it kind of confirms, okay, so we are having some kind of effect. Um, and then... There was another kind of big case which also allowed workfare scheme to be challenged, which was the case of Cat Riley, who was doing voluntary work, which was contributing towards her career in Birmingham, and the workfare scheme moved her out of that and put her into working in Poundland, and she managed to challenge it in court. On, on the, well, she used a kind of forced labour argument, but she basically went on a technicality on the grounds that the government hadn't put in place proper, a, proper, a proper policy process. Unfortunately, then afterwards, the government retroactively change the legislation so that the uh, unlawful act of pushing her into this unpaid work then be retroactively became lawful afterwards, which is quite odd. But um, the point was it managed to raise the publicity and it managed to produce 
significant outcomes. And I think the, the most significant outcomes were that the government effectively couldn't find firms to participate in the scheme because it became so toxic that they, did, they couldn't find people to participate. So I think that probably leads then to me think this kind of idea of what, what's the point of the protest. I think it's quite easy to think that you know, the government's all powerful, we live in neoliberalism, and whatever we do, it seems to just kind of trundle on, and we don't really have much of an influence. And I think there's, there tends to be lots of examples of influence that we tend to kind of filter out, because, partly because we, it's quite a gloomy world. So some recent impacts, just to kind of pluck a few out, this is Natasha Engel, the Commissioner for Shale Gas, who recently uh, resigned as the Commissioner. And in resigning, she said, We know shale gas can be extracted safely. We have the best regulations and regulators in the world. We know the positive impact it has on local communities, but we are choosing to listen to a powerful environmental lobby campaigning against fracking rather than allowing science and evidence to guide our policy making. This is partly in reference to a lot of the anti-fracking protests that we see across Britain, especially in Preston New Road, the Quadrilla site, which was closed down from 2011 to 2018 as a result of protests, partly in result of the alarm at the earthquakes that, and tremors that the fracking was producing. But again, we tend to see how the government still carries on with the fracking agenda, but we have to see as well that, that on the government side, they are concerned about the publicity that the anti-fracking protests create. Um, the Goldsmith anti-racist action occupation, I guess people heard of it, with 137 days in occupation until uh, earlier this year, and managed to, managed to get the uh, Goldsmith in the end to agree to a number of their demands for the introduction of new anti-racist training within the university. And the acting warden again openly acknowledging that while, the university, while they, the university management, cannot condone some of their means of protest, they, the um, Goldsmith Anti-Racist anti Action, have provided us with a wake-up call to take action by sharing their experience and insight. And then one more example, the BA pilot strike, which was the second round of the BA pilot strike at the end of uh, September, which was cancelled, but the problem was that BA had already had to basically schedule in the strike and itself had cancelled all of the flights already, to the extent that Morgan Stanley uh, estimated that the industrial action cost the British Airways up to £130 million. Pounds. So even when people aren't striking, they're still having a disruptive impact and producing significant costs for employers. Just some, uh, a couple of other examples. So the, sometimes, we, sometimes we win through legal battles. So this was the unison uh, legal dispute over the employment tribunal fees, which I mentioned earlier, which then got challenged in court and eventually was overturned on the grounds that it was pre preventing access to, uh, to, um, to justice. And then United Voices of the World, who people again probably know, who are migrant workers, uh, trade union, who have been very active and very successful over the last two or three years and seem to have a new victory to uh, proclaim every week. This is one at LSE when they managed successfully to bring the uh, cleaning staff they were represented back in-house, which again the reversal of neoliberal privatisation is almost unheard of and, and, and seems to illustrate, again, this kind of more direct action forms of publicity as a form of protest being effective. So one kind of, um, when we were discussing with, when I was discussing with Faisy how we going to try and talk about this, we were also talking about well, how, what does this mean in terms of the end of, is there an end of neoliberal hegemony? And probably not yet. But I think we can say it's, it's more unstable than it was five years ago. And I think we can say it's more unstable than it was five years ago, partly because of this kind of age of dissent that we're witnessing. And we can see that in terms of poli the, the political elite, and in the case of Britain, uh, the kind of Corbyn leadership of the Labour Party increasingly having this kind of pro-protest slant. So if, for example, this is John McDonnell providing a statement in support of Extinction Rebellion activists in, uh, in a court case where he says the Extinction Rebellion activists successfully raised the profile of the climate threat and focused the minds of all of us on the radical action that is needed. And this one I think is really nicely telling in terms of the transformation of the Labour Party. So this is, in 2009 there was an occupation by workers at Vestas, which is a, a wind turbine factory on the Isle of Wight. And the workers basically said, come on, the Labour Party stands for green power and it stands for jobs, why wouldn't you nationalise this wind turbine as it's about to be closed down. 
And Peter Manderson, then the business secretary, I, was, I searched everywhere for a statement from the Labour Party. This is the only statement that I could get. And it was, it's been really good to go away and have nice peace and quiet on holiday. It was good and I'm very glad to be back. <laughs> Which was his statement when he was meeting protesters back in, move, going back into the uh, Department of Business. Ten years later, John McDonnell, faced with the Highland and Wolf occupation, which is a shipyard in uh, Northern Ireland, where they had a, I think, 60-day occupation, said, was explicitly stating that what we need is a, some kind of government action. So we know this is a viable concern. We know the government has naval contracts that can put here to ensure the long-term future. We know there are contracts out there, but it just needs support from the government. I am saying to Boris Johnson, very specifically, he can't stand on the sidelines. The contrast, I think, in terms of the political manifestation of how, how especially in terms of the Labour Party, how is that being these forms of dissent being responded to, I think we can see in terms of a, of a, of a shift and, and a reflection of those acts of dissent in terms of political uh, consequences. Which then perhaps brings us to uh, a bit towards populism, Brexit and so on. There's a nice piece... Well, nice work being put out at the moment by somebody called Timo Fetzer talking specifically about how we can directly link the impact of austerity on certain parts of the country, the way that the uh, public spending was specifically cut had a much greater impact on certain parts of the country, that those parts of the country see, a, uh, see the largest increase in support for UKIP over this 10-year period and that this increase in support for UKIP can be directly linked to the support for Brexit. And he argues that uh, the austerity can be essentially be associated with about 6% increase in support for Brexit. So that was enough then to, uh, to push the Leave vote into uh, Leave terrain, into majority terrain. So I think some of this is kind of controversial. I know there's kind of there's a differences over Brexit, to say the least. There's the differences over. There's a the question over whether it's okay to say that it's the left behind that supported the um, that supported the Brexit vote. And some people think this is kind of justifying racism. I think it, I would say it's more that it created a it's created the condition in which the right wing have only got a kind of nativist, uh, racist narrative to appeal left to appeal to voters in these categories and so left with that as the only option when when welfare spending and so on is off the off the table democratic and democratic demands largely are off the table that's kind of where we end up with which is why i think we can see which has basically been the narrative of boris johnson for several years this here he is talking in 2018 we need to ask ourselves some hard questions about the impact of 20 years of uncontrolled immigration by low skilled low wage workers and so on and so on, and Brexit basically gives us the capacity to deal with this problem. <clears throat> so, I mean, I think one, I think I'm running out of time, but then I think one thing I would say then on, okay, Brexit is the leg legitimating strategy of the right in a context of stagnant neoliberalism, but also we probably want to ask what is the cost of legitimate, the cost of legitimating stagnant neoliberalism is itself uh, huge. So the, um, the government's own uh, Operation Yellowhammer sort of identifies clearly the kind of problems that the, the government is, is anticipating and the IFS um, yesterday just re re uh, produced a report predicting that public debt, public, the public deficit would double as a result of Brexit compared to their estimation of what the public deficit would be earlier this year. So in other words, it's not straightforward that using Brexit as a legitimating strategy. If that's the only legitimating strategy that they've got, it's proving to be an expensive one. And again, I think that kind of speaks to this idea of it's not, uh, it's not a straightforward process of producing and, re and securing and reproducing neoliberal hegemony. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so I, there's, I've tr we're trying then to kind of d uh, to link this kind of this kind of analysis and this kind of framework to other contexts. And as a kind of closing, I suppose the um, the what what we're trying to say is that the, the capitalism and democracy have their own logics that will that translate into different contexts. And neoliberalism has its own logic, which translates into different contexts. But those also manifest themselves in different ways, so that we see more neoliberal contexts and we see different forms of neoliberal contexts.
So we looked at, in a study that I'm doing with a group of collaborators, we're trying to show how similar trends can be seen, similar but different trends can be seen, especially in the most neoliberalised contexts of the global north in this case. So we look at the comparison with Spain and the United States and try to say how we can see similar trends, but the, they reflect the model of neoliberal capitalism that developed in those two contexts. So in the US, a much a more racialized forms of inequality associated with Black Lives Matter as a kind of key agent of dissent. And in Spain, the, the very strong reliance on housing and a kind of corrupt political system that was attached to the housing boom. And that there we, see, we, we can see specificities of these types of trends in the Spanish case as well. So I think, I suppose, well, in terms of trying to then see how does this relate to other contexts, I suppose the point that we're trying to make is to what degree is, it near, is, the, is the society neoliberalised, to what degree is growth possible, what growth strategy is necessary, and then what growth, how does that growth strategy then produce different forms of social strain, social conflict, and how, do those, how is there an attempt to reincorporate that social conflict back into a, uh, a model of democratic capitalism. And I think the most polarised is the, mo the most neoliberal context seem to be the most polarised. So in terms of thinking about change, it seems that you have, that the opportunities for change are greater in the most neoliberal contexts of the present. Okay, some conclusions. Capitalism and democracy are becoming e increasingly incompatible. We can think about the age of austerity, but I think we also maybe want to think about it as in terms of an age of dissent. There, are, there seem to be cracks in neoliberalism that are becoming increasingly evident, which is prompting a nativist Brexit, as the, in the British case, as the only solution for the right wing to offer. And that itself has then some global parallels with polarisation, especially in the most neoliberalised contexts. And the obvious question, I think, is what's next, which is probably the thing we don't know. But I think what we also do know is, if we look at, think back to the chart, the school children are the emerging agent of protest in, in the present, it doesn't look like, if we think about sedimentation and how that then produces new subjectivities, it doesn't look like this kind of age of dissent is going away. In fact, it seems to be more generating more conflict and see what happens. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'd now like to hand over to our discussant, um, Dr. Faisi Ismail, who's going to talk, uh, respond for um, five minutes or so to David's very interesting talk. Okay, thanks, David. Um, okay, um, it's just sort of three comments, and in a way, I think we, we, we probably agree on, um, uh, on quite a lot of them. Um, so, I mean, clearly this is a moment of deep, deep crisis, uh, not just in the UK, but, but, but globally, right? We've got financial, we've got a nexus between financial crisis, uh, climate crisis, um, you know, war in Yemen, impending war in, in, in Iran. I mean, th this is, this is a, it, it feels like these, all of these things have never come, come together. And particularly in a, cri in a crisis of, of the climate where we're, we're talking about a kind of, potential civilizational, um, you know, question, which, which I think is, 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 is very scary for people. And, you know, when, when we talk about, um, you know, we know a lot about post-traumatic stress disorder. I think, I think we're, we're, we're now experiencing, particularly among young people, a kind of pre-trauma, a kind of this, this idea that um, what is my future going to be like? You know, I, I'm... I have fear right now, fear and anxiety about, uh, about the future. And in, in that sense, I, I, I very much agree with your uh, point about polarization. And I think that is precisely the logic of, of, of capitalism, that it will produce polarization. So, so this is, is seen in the most neoliberalized uh, countries, but it's also seen, so um, a Trump produces a Sanders. And, it, and obviously, it's not that simple, but you are seeing this kind of, the, the, this, this polarization, the kind of 10 years of, um, of, uh, uh, of, of a Tory government has produced uh, the Corbyn phenomenon. Um, in, in, in France, um, uh, Mélenchon versus, you know, a, a real possibility earlier this year of, of, um, of a, um, a, a, a fascist, um, you know, in the form of Le Pen uh, government. But then you're also seeing it in places where uh, it's all, it feels it's almost the, the, like the Arab uprisings 
um, had a kind of, you know, a, a second wind in Algeria, in Sudan, uh, in, in Morocco, in Egypt, uh, and, and, and so on. And of course, um, uh, of course, Hong Kong. So I just wa wondered if you can kind of comment on that polarization and how progressive uh, movements and things should deal with that. Because if you think about uh, XR, uh, for example, Extinction Rebellion, often there's a narrative which says, let's go beyond politics. Let's put our political differences to one side and, uh, you know, come together around, uh, around these questions. So how do you deal with that? Do you put politics at the center or do you kind of try and move beyond uh, those? Because clearly polarization is, is, um, is very political. <laughs> um, the second point uh, about, about Brexit, I mean, I don't want to say too much about Brexit, but just that, just that it hasn't been a kind of um, n neither inevitable nor... Uh, no kind of um, straightforward shift to the right, right? I mean, in the beginning, in, in any case, it wasn't, it was never a conspiracy. They sort of stumbled into it. And you now have a situation where a minority of a minority in the Tory party is pursuing a policy and is quite hell-bent on pursuing a policy, uh, given, the, given the news today, um, of pushing this policy through, uh, against what the establishment wants. So, I mean, if you, if you think about, you know, what, it, what is it? Vast majority, 99 out of 100 companies on the FTSE 100 uh, uh, want to remain, and yet the traditional vehicle for the establishment, which is the Tory party, is doing exactly the opposite. So, I mean, so you have that crisis for the establishment, and then you have the, the kind of um, associated crisis, which is that normally they can rely on this, uh, on this basically right-wing Labour Party to, you know, to kind of supplement that, that push forward um, of, of their policies. And it's now captured by a very left-wing leader. So that's also a crisis for them. So, so in a way, it's like you have this kind of, um, you know, you have this situation where, where um, it's not... Um, you know, they, they, they appear strong, it's, it's uh, having an effect, but, but actually I think there's, there's, a, there's a contradiction there, there's a real weakness there. And I mean, of course, what happens um, here, what happens in, 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 in other parts of Europe do have an effect globally, clearly. I mean, not just in terms of um, uh, international development policy or foreign policy, but also uh, climate policy, uh, clearly. And then finally, just the question on... Um, movements globally. Uh, I mean, it feels as if in the last 40 years, but in the last 10 or five years even, that, the, that neoliberalism has kind of standardized the conditions under which we're living, right? So, so it's not just um, slave labor in the global south, although that's, you know, predominant, but you are seeing forms of, uh, forms of uh, forced labor, slave labor, and so on. You are seeing food banks, you are seeing wage cuts, you are seeing these things happening in, um, uh, in the global north, and it feels as if we're increasingly seeing uh, protests and responses to that uh, finding outlets in common. So, and that, that's not a new thing. I mean, of course, it goes back to the anti-Vietnam War protests. It goes back, you know, far, far earlier. But I think that it feels as if that's becoming more common. And obviously, that's, that's most expressed in, in the climate strikes most recently, the way, where, where people can feel some sort of solidarity with, with others. And you're going to start it here, or we're going to start it there. And, and, and obviously, you know, social media has, uh, has helped with it. So it feels as if there's this mainstreaming uh, of protest in which it's become a legitimate form of... Um, uh, of action, um, and I suppose, um, but but that kind of the, the so the conditions seem to be, you know, becoming increasingly standardised. The response is becoming increasingly standardised, and then what you ended with was um, the kind of the fact that you know the, this is starting to these questions are starting to be at least responded to or get or or. or increasingly younger people are starting to engage with these issues. I mean, you, know, you go on some of these uh, youth strikes and you'll see five-year-old five kids on, the, on these protests, you know, some vague awareness of, of what's happening and that it's not good. So I wondered if you could just comment on, on you know, what, kind of a, what kind of an impact that, uh, that could have, I guess. 
Okay, thank you very much, Faisy. Um, what we'll do now, I think, is open up to questions from the floor. And um, at the end, David will um, pull everything together and comment on Faisy's comments and respond to, to questions. Um, so we'll take maybe three or four questions first. Um, there are mics coming around, so when the mic comes to you, please say your question. If you just put your hand up, if you have one. Thank you very much. My name is Lord. Um, I would like to find out about the relationship between capital and labor. Your presentation seems to me that there is a capital hegemony over labor. How do we reverse that? Do you see a continuity in future whereby capital will continue to dominate labor? or you will see labor overcoming capital in future. Thank you. There's one behind. Um, hi, my name is Montita. Um, can I, sorry, can I just ask when you speak into the mic if you can speak up because it's quite a big room. <laughs> um, hi, thanks for that. Uh, my name is Montita. I was wondering um, in terms of not just the legitimacy of neoliberalism being questioned and undermined and increasingly um, untenable, but the legitimacy of like nation states as organizing units um, being kind of undermined and um, revealed to be untenable, especially if the ways that they're, I guess, justifying their existence are increasingly relying on like logics of securitization and, you know, kind of, uh, these threads of what racism, imperialism, kind of, uh, that, yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Bailey, and I was wondering if you could talk about um, sort of like the theory of um, accel accelerationism um, just sort of like looking at the graph you showed about um, how unrest increases and then um, like drops off when um, concessions are made. Um, I was wondering in your research uh, what you um, think about that kind of theory. Perhaps we'll give David the chance to respond to those three first and then we'll take another round. Thanks. I'll maybe just, uh... <laughs> Thanks. Maybe I'll just respond as well to the Faisal's comments, thank you. Um, so, so you talk about um, the, the polarization that I talk about, what effect does that have and how should we respond to it? I think basically saying, you know, do we embrace the polarization or do we, uh, do we try to moderate it? I suppose I'm not entirely sure that we have a choice, would be, I think, my response, in that it seems like the only, if we're saying the only legitimating strategy that the right have is a kind of nativism, it seems, then it's, it seems that we've pushed into a kind of polarization in which a sort of more moderate agenda doesn't really gain traction, which I think, I mean, it, it seems to me that we can probably agree that the kind of, so, the old social democratic parties suffered significant declines over the last 20 years and I think the reason for that is because they, were, they, they became unable to speak to people's gr economic grievances especially, and, and their grievances in general, and that led, and it partly was a contributing factor to the emergence of a kind of nativist, populist right, which was able to kind of jump in a gap that was left in terms of how do, what, do we, what do we offer people in this context of kind of stagnant neoliberalism, it seemed that a sort of nativist agenda was the was one plausible solution. So I think that has created the polarization. I don't think there's really a choice. Basically, the only way the only way to respond to that is to try to rearticulate a left agenda that can try to have some kind of some kind of response to that. Basically, so I wouldn't. I don't really see that there's much of a choice. I I don't think, which kind of speaks then to the idea of Brexit. So the we should we, in a different way. So you were saying if I'm saying. You're saying Brexit maybe wasn't 
kind of inevitable, it was something constructed rather than a sort of inevitable response of neoliberal, a neoliberal stagnation. I think I'm saying it, probably, it, perhaps it was an inevitable response. There needs to be some kind of uh, 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 nativist legitimating strategy in a context where democratic outcome, democratic options are limited and constrained. And that, so we, the Brexit has, it has its roots in things like the hostile environment, it has its roots in the right wing of the Conservative Party, which came to ascendance. And I think that was, in some ways, the only option available to the, to, uh, the Conservative Party to try to think of ways to appeal. A sort of centrist appeal had lost, and so they were pushed to the right in the same way that the centrist appeal of the, from the centre-left has lost appeal and pushed things to the, a more kind of uh, left agenda. I, I, suppose, I suppose what I, what I, I think... I think this might be the only. I think this might be the only mic that's working. So if we share it between the three of us, um, I suppose. I suppose what I mean is is um, is that the establishment or the ruling class didn't didn't want it. So so that's an interesting thing. I mean, you know, I I, I get that that it's a problem and that it's a way. It's a it's a legitimating strategy. It's a way to kind of uh, appeal because the centrism as 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 basically lost or, or it doesn't have appeal uh, but then how do we explain or how do we make sense of the fact that the vast majority of the ruling class don't even want it <laughs> so it's like it's just this we it's this this kind of situation where something's happening and the people in charge or the, the kind of traditional ruling class is 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 not at the fourth is not driving it through it's basically happening despite them yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Financial Times is writing today about the Financial Times is writing today about how a Corbyn government would produce great higher levels of growth than a Johnson government. So, there's, so like you say, so the, the 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 capitalist class are are seeing problems in terms of the legitimating strategies that are emerging. But I suppose I suppose what I'm saying is legitimation isn't an option. There needs to be some method of legitimation in place, and it's difficult to see how the right can come up with one that isn't drawing on these kind of nativist uh, uh, tropes to try to, to produce something that can appeal to people. Uh, in terms of mainstreaming of the mainstream of protests, I think this is what, one of the points I was trying to make. The more that protest becomes the only way in which a voice can be articulated, the more you've got to be imaginative, so it becomes a, it becomes a, dri a drive to become more and more imaginative all the time. And partly it becomes... A, uh, kind of mundane, so the government is less easily shamed. I think maybe the boycott workfare that I was talking about yeah. might, like, only six years later, might not be as embarrassing for the government now as it was six years ago. People have got used to austerity and food banks and uh, hyper-exploitation and just basically you have to live with it. And so I think the kind of shock value that comes from some of the protests is starting to wear off, which then obviously pushes things, tries to put, if you're going to try and make, get your voice heard, requires, uh, again, new ways to, in which to try to <coughs> achieve that. In terms of uh, capital, capital labour, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that, partly that, that the, I guess the kind of autonomist argument of like, we shouldn't think of it in terms of capital dominating labour, but also we should think about labour problematising the reproduction of capital, is kind of what I'm trying to say. So what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is, well, what does that look like in the present? And we, one way that we can try to kind of ex explore that is to say, well, First of all, what types of dissent can we see? There's a visible forms of dissent, but there are obviously also more subterranean forms of dissent where people just think the government's all crooks and we don't listen to them and we just try and get the best we can out of the situation. But there's also then the, we can try to spot the gaps in this strategy, in the way in which um, authority is secured, which is what I'm trying to do in terms of looking, for example, at the uh, shale gas uh, uh, commissioner resigning and explicitly saying the reason I'm resigning is because we can't produce the policies that we want because the protesters are too successful in terms of making this a kind of toxic environment. So I'm trying to say that's one of the ways in which labour is problematising if we I mean, have a broad category of labour, not just workers but people engaged in waged work and non-waged work and susceptible in multiple ways to exploitation and not having the opportunity available to them to benefit from the ownership of capital, those people constantly able to problematise in different ways uh, a regime. And that's what I guess we're try I'm trying to sort of think about and map out. In terms of the legitimacy, legitimacy of the nation state, 
I think it seems to me that the, the current context is kind of un, clearly undermining the sort of cosmopolitan hegemony of the 1990s and first half of the 2000s when it was seen to be we're just going to have these new supranational forms of um, cosmopolitan liberal governance which now looks a bit too triumphalist given that there seems to be a reversal and a return to the nation state. And then uh, sort of an accelerationism, I'm, I'm not sure I'm an accelerationist or definitely know what it means but I think um, the point is to use the tools that I think the point of the accelerations is to use the tools that capitalism produces. So capitalism has to have this drive for technology, for rational, for mechanisation, for new forms of efficiency, and that we don't just say, isn't that a terrible thing that capitalism is doing, but we try to use those tools to, to our own benefit. That then sort of somehow links to demands like um, universal basic income, I think along the lines of if we're going to accept that, um, that we're moving towards a a kind of jobless economy because technology can produce so much stuff then we're going to have to find ways to maintain consumption and demand especially so one example of the an accelerationist strategy is to promote the idea of universal basic income as a, as a floor of consumption that could um, that could enable reproduction of capitalist system given those conditions so then the question is well that, is that going to Quell dissent, I think, is your question. Um, and I suppose with the universal basic income, it basically depends what type of universal basic. I mean, you could say universal credit in the UK is a form of or moving in that direction, but it's so low that, first of all, you can't get it and you can't rely on it. So it's unlikely to produce uh, a quelling of dissent. So it also seems to, for me unlikely that you can quell dissent. Cap capitalism is an antagonistic system, and so. It seems unlikely whatever concession is produced produces its own form of crisis and its own. I mean, the concession that I, I mean, the main concession of neoliberalism, it seems, was that financialization enabled a massive increase in wealth in housing, and that was a just particularly a particular generation benefited from that concession, which has worn off now because the next generation can't afford to buy a house. So the that then so the concession that's in, that's used has a knock-on effect and produces new forms of crisis and new forms of t tension and strain, and that's I suppose what I'm trying to figure out. Okay, we'll take another round of questions. If you can put your hand up. So. Yes. Okay, so my name is Alex, and my question is, uh, what is the cause of the growing student or school children protest? Because in the uh, graph you have shown, and um, there is like a sharp growth of the number of student and uh, school children protest. It has been the number one like protest in recent years. So what is the cause of that? Because if it's another type of protest, for example, the feminist or the environmentalist, there is some kind of pressure group or organization behind it. But for school children, there is just no clear like, group of people organizing them to do so. So what is the cause of the growing number of the school children protests? Um, so I'm Teresa, thank you, and I'm Portuguese, and in Portugal two days ago we had um, national elections and uh, the percentage of uh, abstention was about 45.5 and four years ago, so last um, parliamentary elections, was about 43, so we are beating records. Uh, my question is how to tackle the most basic demonstration of participation in uh, the future of a country, yeah, democracy, which is voting. <laughs>
Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Sort of following on that question, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more about the relationship between these forms of dissent and protest and sort of more mainstream or traditional progressive forces. You know, in the UK, that would be the Labour Party. And what would be the ways for Corbyn's Labour to capture these energies, you know, like XR, etc.? Take a couple more, if anyone has anything. Hey, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my name's Rob. And um, just relating to other countries outside the highly neoliberalized context, for example, South Africa, Zimbabwe, um, where we're seeing more of a nativist uh, indigenization kind of policies coming through. Um, just wanting to see, are we seeing this more as a nationalization across the globe as a result of globalization? Or is there kind of more of this battle between kind of capitalism not working um, and it kind of influx against democracy? So just really kind of thinking outside of uh, that relationship you mentioned, is globalization actually not working um, for us as a whole because we like to stick to our own? <laughs> Thanks. One more. Um, I mean, this is still building on the previous questions about the relation between kind of the represented, representative elective democracy and these protests. I, I'm wondering in particular about an issue like the climate crisis, where um, the debate that's going on in like institutional politics is, in my eyes, not the debate we should be having, because it's about whether climate change is real or not and, and how far we should do something about it. Whereas actually the question should be more political about how this transition should happen and whose interests should be um, considered. So I was wondering if you could speak about how the kind of the dialogue and the political dialogue is often seems confined in these institutional politics. If that makes sense. Okay, so that's, we might have time for one more round after this, so. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of questions around participation. I suppose the, the, the gen, general question is about the relationship between the institutional tier and what's going on in terms of civil society, how civil society is mobilising and how should we try to understand uh, that relationship uh, in different contexts. And I, I, I think a general trend that is a general trend that seems to me is that it, there has been a rejection of the institutional sphere as something which was essentially uh, dead and closed off, and that all, of in, all interesting forms of politics would start, were taking place outside of the institutional sphere that, that from the period, especially before 2008, um, kind of anti-globalization movements, all, there, was, there was a general consensus that um, we should pretty much give up, I think, on the parliamentary sphere, that it had no capacity to really accommodate demands, that the, to, it, to actually, actively try to engage with the parliamentary sphere was itself um, uh, a, a debilitating act. And I suppose John Holloway's Change the World Without Taking Power kind of sums up that, that kind of agenda of reject parliamentary politics, reject parliamentary politics and... Um, and try to construct new forms of societies outside of the parliament and, and in, within society. And so I think what we're seeing in the post-2008 period is a, kind, is a questioning of that, and a, but a cynical questioning of that, or a sceptical questioning of that. So there's a re-engagement with the institutions, but there's a re-engagement with the institutions, I think, in a, with a recognition that they probably aren't our friend as well at the same time. So that, and, and I think that's probably how I would see. So when we ask questions like, why is there no participation in, in formal voting? Then in one sense, my response is, well, who really cares? Because what are you going to achieve anyway if you, by electing a left government that's then going to have to capitulate to global financial forces and everyone gets very disappointed and then doesn't quite know what to do, which is kind of, I think, what happened in Greece. 
So who really cares if the voting level is low? But then there's a, there's a questioning of that dismissal, but there's also, and at the same time, a questioning of the re-entering into the institutions. So I think we're in a stage where we basically don't know. We've tried, we've tried to change the world without taking power, and we've, before that we've tried to build, build the party and win the, win the elections for the left. Both of them seemed problematic, and now we're in a situation where we don't quite know which, and so we basically try a bit of anything and see if that will produce the types of outcomes that, that we uh, would like to see happening. And it seems to me that's, roughly speaking, the kind of Corbyn project, probably Sanders project um, in Portugal. It's, that, that's, it seems like that's the kind of, that was the, coalition, the left coalition. It seemed to be a kind of grassroots movement attached to the more mainstream left party. And then, but interestingly, it hasn't then generated high levels of participation. So it hasn't had the subsequent repoliticization of the formal sphere either. It didn't seem like. So, so I don't know why that why we see that those outcomes, but I think, that, I think that's how I would understand it in terms of this kind of um, rejection of the rejection of parliamentarism, but in a sceptical way in which we, um, we recognise that probably we have to engage with the parliamentary sphere, but we also think it's also going to bite us back when, when we do. Um, I think that answers the question about what sort of transition, what was our plan for transition what the, in terms of participation. In terms of uh, why are students and especially school children engaging, I think Faisy, I mean, I, I agree with what Faisy was saying. Basically, the, the situation we were in is the younger you are, the more screwed you are. And the, sadly, and that the older you are, the more wealthy and comfortable your life has been. And that is, seems to be, in a lot of contexts, the type of situation that we're facing. So, like I was talking about before, the one-off benefit of the big financial injection into the housing market, which produced a one-off payoff, which can't be repeated because people have now got the expensive houses, and so the next generation can't afford to buy them. That, that, that pattern can be seen in multiple spheres. I mean, university education, obviously, uh, I didn't pay any tuition fees, and if I went to university now I'd end, in the UK, I'd end up with 50,000 pounds worth of debt. So I, there is a looming sense of what the future hold for young people and school children. And first of it was students in 2010 with the tuition fees, and now it seems to be school children with a recognition that we have a dual, at least a dual um, crisis in terms of the environmental crisis and in terms of a uh, economic crisis. But the, um, so uh, Keir Milburn's had a book out called Generation Left, which talks about this. Basically, what we're seeing in those two crises is the next generation bearing the burden of the benefit, the costs that are associated with the goods that the previous generation had. So the previous generation used up all the carbon and the, pre and the previous generation used up all the debt that fueled their assets which now are unavailable to the next generation. So there's a kind of generational conflict which falls along class conflict lines as well. So I think that's, in terms of why they're doing it, I would talk about that. In terms of how are they doing it, I think it's self-organizing. So in Birmingham, where I am, it's basically 15 and 16-year-old children meeting in the protest and then going on um, WhatsApp and Instagram and, um, f and figuring out how do, we, how do we hold the next one. Not Facebook, because that's for old people. But, um, and, glo and then globalization, does global, is global, I think the question is, is, I think the question is, can be translated into, is there an inherent nativist uh, narrative that can be picked on by the right to f try to f legitimate itself and boost its popularity and so on, or is it a t sign of the times? And I, I think probably capitalist democracy always has that risk because there's all there's ten, needs to be governed by a state and a state needs to be territorial in some way and that territorialism needs to be justified and that tends to produce then national identity, nativism, patri patriotism and so on. So all of that, that kind of conditions always exist but it just when you're in a context where you can't meet other demands you've got to rely on God save the Queen as your sort of legitimating strategy. Thank you. I think we have time for um, two or three more questions if anyone has anything more that they want to.
Um, regarding the um, dissent, is that um, just over here, right in front of you? Um, you mentioned that uh, the dissent, as I understand it, dissent comes about as um, this frustration between democracy and capitalism um, um, intensifies, and there are no routes through democracy in order to. Um, get those concessions. So dissent happens and then it's only through concessions that this payoff can happen. Is it that you don't foresee any, because it seems like, as you, as you mentioned, there were concessions made um, um, previously and um, if we look at maybe this kind of double movement framework, it, it's as if you know, the political institutions or you know, the holders of political power aren't willing to give concessions, maybe because there aren't any concessions to be made. Do you foresee is that there aren't any more concessions to be made unless we have, and I use it in the most strictest terms, um, strictest way, um, revolutionary change. Um, and what sort of change would that um, be? Um, yeah, that's my question. Hi, uh, my name is Maria, I come from Brazil. And um, um, I thought was interesting the thing that Teresa said about uh, um, people that not, not going to vote. In Brazil, we are obliged to vote. And even though 25% of people don't go voting, and even knowing that they are not going to get their passports or they, and they are not going to be able to going to a public competition if they don't vote. So it's quite uh, interesting <laughs> in a sense. 20% 20, 20 of the population just think that they won't be able to travel and they won't be able to pass to a public competition, to a public uh, position. But um, the other thing that I was going to ask Maybe I am asking something that would uh, force you to talk, talk about something that you didn't talk yet. But you mentioned the word populism in your title and you didn't mention it during your presentation. And I would like to uh, know the connection, to understand the connection that you are making between austerity and populism, it would be interesting for me to know about it. Hi, uh, I have a sort of related question to that. It's the link between, yeah, um, so the way, the way in which right-wing populist movements and, and figures are sort of adapting and adopting left-sounding arguments around like critiques of financialized globalization, for example, and um, yeah, so what you think about how the left can counter that and what's the way forward for that? One more question. May, anyone who hasn't had the chance to ask yet? Maybe, up there? Uh, okay, let's take a few more and then. Hi, right here. Um, I guess my question is going to sound a little bit pessimistic, but I, I just want to get your thoughts on it. Im imagine there's a second referendum and the thought process is, then the vote comes out and it's leave again. And next year, Trump uh, wins a second election. Do you think uh, protests remain a viable option of, uh, I guess, calling for change? Or do you think that almost something more radical will be needed? Hi, my, my name is Akmo. Uh, do you think at one time we will have a balance between democracy and capitalism? Or we have to lose one? Either we have austerity or we have democracy or none of them. Thank you. Okay, I think we just had one last question at the front. First, thank you very much for answering my previous question. And my second question is related to the government concession question. And uh, its protest is a reliable um, way to change. My question is, is it a little bit misleading, you think, that protest is the only way to change? Because um, 
It sh protest in some way shows the public opinion and shows the will of people to change. But what if someone is just really good at mobilizing people go on the street to do protest and force the government to change that is not a really need needing change. Like the change is not that, that urgent to be done. Right? Thanks. Um, so it seems like we're asking about um, how we're going to change the world, <laughs> and um, and is and is protest an option? I suppose. I suppose I see both of them as sort of connected. So. Um, I suppose I, I suppose I'm saying dissent isn't necessarily you kind of only that you have a kind of aim and you think okay how do I dissent to achieve that aim. Dissent also becomes a necessity at a certain point because you, you have to find a way to survive. So if economic, if, you're, if, you're, if your ability to reproduce yourself as a being becomes sufficiently difficult and the, 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 the kind of commodity network that surrounds us and that produces the, the formal way in which we're able to achieve that doesn't allow us to achieve that, then we kind of have to turn to forms of dissent or alternative, or maybe we can even think about it in terms of alternative forms of association rather than alternative forms of dissent. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that for capitalism, alternative forms of association are also a form of dissent. So I suppose we could think about things like Argentina, fact, the factory occupations that took place there after 2001 as one way of trying to sustain, people trying to sustain themselves in the context in which there weren't any jobs. It's not necessarily that factory occupation is a form of dissent, it's a, it's a form of survival, which then get, becomes a form of dissent as well because it doesn't fit with the logic of uh, commodity exchange as the way in which we're supposed to organize uh, our, so our reproduction of ourselves. So in that sense, it's, I don't, I'm not sure that it, protest or dissent are necessarily always a, an option. It's more like you, you've got to do something and that then sometimes is a, becomes a form of dissent, a form of resistance. Sometimes it's more visible, more organized, more prominent, and makes it into the newspapers, and sometimes it's more like foot, foot dragging of some kind, criminal activity sometimes, and so on. It's, and it's, there's, it's not, I suppose the point I'm trying to make is it's not the case that it's optional, it's, it's, it's that you, we need to find some way in which to survive, and it's quite often the case that that possibility doesn't present itself through the formal permitted uh, means. Um, just on uh, Brazil, I mean, I, so I'd ask, but do you, I mean, I'd probably ask it back to you. When, so is the decision not to vote, is it uh, like an act, of, an act of opposition or is it just there's no point because you, didn't, you weren't going to get to the formal sector anyway and you, and you weren't going to fly anyway either, so it doesn't really matter if you get those penalties. <laughs> Yeah. So it's not. Yeah. So it's not. It's not even necessarily an act of resistance or opposition. It's just the formal sphere is, doesn't touch you. So there's no point in. Yeah. 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 Uh, so there was a question around um, the second referendum. If the second referendum voted leave, and if the uh, if Trump wins again, then is, is protest the only option? Which I think is better, going back to this kind of general question, well, what are we going to do? So the, it's kind of double movement question as well. What it, the, is our concessions enough? How do we produce the, a substantial change? And I think probably, I mean, historically what happens, unfortunately, is that war is what kind of clears it out. And the tensions become so, 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 so substantial that... Um, the, the challenge of legitimating, the challenge of managing expansion, and the, and the challenge of uh, mutual hostilities that that generates has tended to lead to war. So that also currently, unfortunately, doesn't look entirely uh, impossible. I mean, Trump's obvious agenda is to push a hostile, uh, a hostile agenda internationally. We mentioned Iran already. It's obviously, there's obviously hostile relations with China in an economic trade war, but that obviously then can spill over so I think if we're trying to say what, how does this incompatibility between democracy and capitalism normally get managed, the, when it reaches the peak of the crisis, it quite often end, ends in a, 
as war is the way that it, that gets resolved. That doesn't sound very happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, then, but then they're still, it doesn't resolve the tension is the point, isn't it, obviously? So then you still have to find a way to survive in those kind of contexts. I mean, that's sort of the narrative that we use to explain the, the emergence of the welfare state, that people didn't want to, the people were collectivised through the experience of war and that they great, great, gained a collective consciousness through the experience of war and they didn't want to have another war and so they were willing to push a more socialist agenda. So if you... So. Thank you for the, all the comments and for uh, listening. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'd like to um, thank Dr. David Bailey very much for a fascinating talk and response to all the questions, and also thank Dr. Faisi Ismail for her comments and all of you for such a great contribution to this first seminar. Um, we'd like to invite you all to um, continue the conversation in a small reception we have um, at the end of each of these seminars, which will be in the SCR, which is on the first floor. Um, there'll be some nibbles, some drinks, and um, you can continue these um, comments and thoughts and, and uh, talk to everyone about it. I'd also like to um, invite you all to come to next week's seminar, which will be uh, the same day next week, the 15th of October, with Adam Hanier, which will be Money, Markets and Monarchies, the Political Economy of the Contemporary Middle East. Thank you very much.